This is one of those weird moments where I have good news, but it's about the fact that Christian nationalists are increasingly adamant and open about their desire to restrict voting rights for minorities in order to preserve the dominance of their worldview. So there's kind of no way that the good aspect of it can be more than marginal, but it is good news. So to get there, though, let's start with the terrifying aspect of this. Christians are getting worse. Right, like, like nine years ago, they were so bad that we thought, hey, you know, we need to spend all of our free time podcasting about how dangerous these motherfuckers are. And then they spent nine years getting ever more dangerous. And then last week, we got a report that said they're getting so much fucking worse, y'all. Now, the report in question was a project from the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and a bunch of it was authored by friend of the show, Andrew Seidel, and it focused on the role that Christian nationalism played in the January 6th riot, but also on the implications of what that might mean for the future of American democracy. And this report obviously is terrifying. It's 66 painstaking pages that outline all the ways in which Christianity played an integral part in the deadly Capitol riot. It's a fascinating and actually very readable document that we'll have linked in the show notes, of course. But suffice to say, it doesn't shy away from the very real ways that Christian rhetoric and political activism over the last few decades enabled Trump, Trump supporters, and ultimately the Capitol rioters. It plainly states that without a ready institution of conspirators in the form of evangelical Christian churches, none of this shit ever could have happened in the first place. Seidel even goes to an extensive list of Christian symbols, Bible verses, and prayers that accompanied the rioters. But despite its focus on January 6th of 2021, it's not a backwards-looking document. The point of the entire report is very clearly that this is not the end of the Christian nationalist insurrection. And to make that point, it outlines many ways that their tactics are evolving. And, and the primary tactic that they highlight, as I already mentioned, is the desire to restrict voting. The entire point of Christian nationalism is the idea that America should be more explicitly Christian. And since that would never earn a majority vote in a free election, they don't want free elections anymore. In other words, they were great with majority rule while they were the majority. All that being said, there is good news at the heart of this, like I started off mentioning, because this report wasn't just shared with a bunch of atheist activists. It was presented to Congress in a hearing hosted by the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Instead of being restricted to podcasters and bloggers who can shout about it to people who already recognize the problem, it's being discussed in the halls of power. Now, say what you will about their attendance and scope, but conversations about the dangerous direction that Christian nationalism is taking and the threat it poses to our democracy are taking place in an official capacity in Congress. And look, a, a big part of the reason we started this show and indeed this movement, right, was, was that stuff like this wasn't being talked about in Congress. Like during the Obama era, we had this increasingly large and vocal minority talking about their holy mission to take Jesus's country back for the white man. And people in power were like, well, are you guys just wacky? And things like Project Blitz and Pulpit Freedom Sunday openly state their goals to subvert both the laws and the system that makes laws possible. And that's not because they're brave. It's because they're invincible. They know that no American politician can afford to stand up to even the most heinous incarnation of Christianity. So they just toss a cross on their racist, treasonous bullshit like it was a bulletproof vest. But thanks to Jared Hoffman, Jamie Raskin, and the 14 members of Congress that make up the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, they have reason to start wondering about that. I mean, you know, you look, 16 out of 535, that's not much, but it's a start. Keep in mind that the Free Thought Caucus is all of four years old. It was started in 2018, and a lot of the reason that it's there at all is because of concerted effort by atheist activists, specifically the efforts over the last decade and a half to increase our visibility. This is what progress looks like. I, I know it's not what we want it to look like. We want big, sweeping changes that eradicate major problems, but that almost never actually happens. And when it does, those sweeping changes are tenuous as hell. Right, Whatever mechanism created them so quickly is almost certainly going to be able to destroy them just as quickly when the political pendulum swings the other way. But incremental changes have to be dismantled one piece at a time. And, and, and so as frustrating as it is, in the long run, it's often better. I, I know nobody wants to hear me talk about slow and steady winning the race, but damn it, if we don't have a fucking midterm election coming up later this year that Republicans are expected to dominate. Now, I know our audience isn't big enough to swing the outcome of that or anything, but if our sites aren't set on big sweeping changes, we can still go to the polls enthusiastic, knowing that we're going to be tacking one more atheist vote onto the demographics that all the politicians are looking at. And if we're lucky, 
Maybe we can send one or two more Congress people to the Free Thought Caucus.